How can you tell if someone is a fan? How can you tell if someone is a fan of a sports team or a musician? Pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, for sports fans, often you wear the clothes, you have the jersey. Uh, some extreme ones, they buy the tickets and they go out even during cold weather to the games. You watch the games at home, you cheer loud and proud. Uh, I have a Green Bay Packer hat that I wear, and every time I wear this hat, I get a reaction. Uh, there have been times where I've gone grocery shopping with this hat on, and people stop me and say, go Pack Go. On the other side, there have been times where I would take a walk and through my neighborhood, and somebody would drive past me, roll down the windows, and say, hey, you can't wear that in Viking country. Uh, every time uh, I wear that hat, I get a reaction because people know when I have that hat on that I'm a fan. Uh, what about musicians? Uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I, we watched this documentary on a teenage pop star named Billie Eilish. And she kind of stands out among the rest because she dyed her hair green. You know, you, you kind of stand out when you have green hair, right? And then the camera it panned to the crowd and you saw this sea of young teenage girls screaming, some had tears down their eyes, and guess what color they were wearing? Green, right? You could tell that they were fans by what they wear, by how they acted, the things that they did. But I don't care so much about sports teams and musicians. We're in church, so let me ask you this. How can you show others that you are a follower of Jesus? How do you let the rest of the world know that you are a follower of Jesus? Because as Christians, we talk about having faith. Faith that what the Bible teaches is true. We have faith deep in our hearts that we believe what the Bible teaches, that we are born in sin and that we deserve eternal death and hell. But because of Jesus, he washes away all of our sins. Because Jesus died on the cross and came back to life, we are promised that we will give a new life when we die as well, and we'll get to go to be with Jesus in heaven. Our faith gives us peace. It gives us purpose. It gives us security. And I pray that you have that faith deep in your heart. But I also pray that your faith is a faith that is shown and is evident to other people. I pray that you have a faith that works, a faith that shows other people that you are a Christian. So how do you show that you are a follower of Jesus? Should we get Jesus jerseys? Should we get a Jesus baseball cap? Should we wear sandals like Jesus and grow beards like Jesus? Uh, instead, when Jesus was asked his disciples about this, he told them, if you want the rest of the world to know that you are my disciples, love one another. If you want other people to know that you're my follower, you're my disciple, it's pretty simple. Love one another. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the earth. And we show that we have that faith deep in our hearts. We show that faith by loving other people. And today, we are going to look at a church. A church that gave a great example that had faith, but wasn't afraid to show their faith. We read about this church in Acts chapter 11. It's a church found in the city of Antioch. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled. They went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So during this early Christian church, the new church, the beginning of this church, they faced opposition and persecution right away. A couple chapters previously, we read about a man named Stephen, who was the first martyr for the faith. He was so bold in his face that he faced persecution, and he was willing to give up his life for the faith. But because of that, other Christians realized that it wasn't safe to be a Christian where Stephen was living, in the Jerusalem area. So some Christians packed up their lives and moved. Like refugees, they moved to different areas because the persecution was so bad. And they were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And some of these believers in Jesus went to a city called Antioch. 
Antioch was kind of like our Chicago. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. So you think about the United States, you have New York, LA, and the third one is Chicago. And that was their Antioch. It was a large cosmopolitan area with all sorts of mixes and races and backgrounds and nationalities and religious views, a large cosmopolitan area. And some of the Christians moved there and they began to share their faith. They began to live out their faith and take that faith and share it with other people. And what's significant in this passage is we see that they begin to share it with the Greeks, meaning non-Jewish people. And this is one of the first Bible passages we have of the early church actively seeking out non-Jewish people, Greek people, and sharing their faith with them. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So God blessed their efforts, and people came to faith. And what I love so much about this, the, the, the fact that a church formed in Antioch, was that no one had a plan to form a church in Antioch. No one had a five-year goal. No one wrote down a mission strategy and said, we're going to go here, then we're going to go here and share our faith with the people in Antioch. It's something that kind of just happened. They experienced these hardships, they experienced these persecutions, and they moved to Antioch because they had to, and where they were, they started sharing their faith. And what I love so much about that is that even though as people, as humans, they didn't have plans for this, God had a plan. God had a plan to get the gospel to Antioch, and he did that through using the Christians who were scattered because of the persecution. And that leads to our first point of application today. Bloom where you are planted. Bloom where you are planted. Each one of us in this room is in a different situation in life. And I truly believe that God put you in that situation for a reason. And it might not be clear to you. You might not know why you're in this situation in life. You might not like this situation in life. But God put you where you're at for a reason. And we are called to bloom where we are planted. None of the Christians had plans of moving to Antioch. But they had to. So they did. And while they were in Antioch, they lived out their Christian faith and shared that faith with other people. And the same is true for you and me. You started a new job? Look, there's your new mission field. You joined a new sports team? Look, there's your mission field. You moved to a new neighborhood? Look, there's your new mission field. No matter what situation in life God has put you there, he's put you there for a reason. So we are called to bloom where we are planted. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Jerusalem kind of acted as the hub for the early Christian church. And when news about the church in Antioch came to Jerusalem, the Christians there were ecstatic. They were so glad that people came to faith in Antioch, and they said, we got to see this for ourselves. we got to send one of our leaders out to Antioch to see this. So they sent a man named Barnabas. Barnabas was a nickname, actually. Uh, earlier in the Bible, we find out that his real name, the name that was given to him, was Joseph. But Barnabas is a name that means son of encouragement. He's Mr. Encourager. He is a guy that is so good at encouraging other people that people just started calling him that. They started calling him the son of encouragement. And they knew that this new group of Christians must need some encouragement. So they sent the son of encouragement, Barnabas, to Antioch to encourage them, to teach them God's word. Lately, there's been a trend uh, that I've noticed on the internet with um, people being reunited that have been separated for so long because of COVID. There are all these heartwarming uh, stories and videos coming out about uh, grandparents and grandkids who are separated for a whole year because of COVID. 
but now people have been getting their shots and now they get to see each other again. And I'd like to show you uh, one of the, my favorite videos I saw this week of this. It's a, it's a family that's surprising two grandparents. They traveled 800 miles to go see them and they found them uh, in a local diner eating lunch and we get to see the reaction of the grandparents when they see their grandkids for the first time after a year. So here we go. Like I said, pretty heartwarming, isn't it? Uh, I was watching these videos by myself this last week, and I was looking around the room saying, who started cutting onions in here? Because, you know, there's a little, <laughs> little something in my eye. Uh, and it was great to be able to see these families uh, that got reunited. And video calls are great. Phone calls are great. Text messages are great. But there's something powerful about being with one another in person, isn't there? as you can see in these videos. That's true for us, and it's also true that God says about the power of gathering with one another as Christians, the power of Christian fellowship. God's word is powerful, and yes, it works through a computer screen, and yes, it works through a podcast, but gathering together as Christians and being able to worship with one another in person is such a powerful thing. And Barnabas knew that. Barnabas knew that. He knew that it was powerful to be with one another in person. He could have written a nicely worded letter to the Christians at Antioch, but instead he said, no, I need to take the trip. I need to see these Christians. I need to encourage them face to face. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. This is how God describes Barnabas. And wouldn't you love to be described the same way? A good man, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. And what stands out to me is that this description of Barnabas is a little different than how we normally talk about people today. You know what I notice like when people talk about other people, sometimes like pastors, What's the first thing you say about him? It's like, oh, he's a good preacher. Or, oh, he's a good teacher. But instead, we see here, we see compliments on Barnabas' character and the way how he lived out his Christian life. Barnabas was a wonderful encourager. He is somebody that lived out his faith, and he showed his faith to other people, and they were blessed because of it. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So Barnabas encouraged this group of Christians. He lived out his Christian faith. He showed them what it was like to be a Christian. And for the first time, the believers in Jesus were called Christians. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that the word Christian only shows up three times in the Bible? Only three times. I probably said the word Christian 15 times just in the sermon alone. Uh, but in the Bible, it only shows up three times. And this is the first place where it shows up. It's a term that means literally little Christ. And it was a term that was given to them by the outside world. They were called this, meaning they didn't come up with this name on their own. And I think that is just so wonderful. Because you know what that means? You have a group of people who believe in Jesus and they have their lives changed by the message of Jesus and they start living out their lives like Jesus and the rest of the world sees them and says, you guys look like little Christs. When they lived out their Christian faith, other people noticed. And that leads to our second point. The power of living a Christian life. I think it's so easy for me when I start thinking about uh, like what can I do as a pastor to grow this church, to bring more people to the faith, that kind of thing. Usually the first place my mind goes to is I gotta take a class. I gotta work on my skills. I have to read another book. I need to watch a video about this subject. 
And there's a time and a place to work on skills. Working on skills is great. But what we see in the book of Acts, just the importance of how it is to live a Christian life and the power of living a Christian life and how you live your Christian life, other people will notice and other people's lives will be changed as well. And we see that with Barnabas. He wasn't called a dynamic preacher. He wasn't called a big extrovert or somebody with an entrepreneurial spirit and that's how the church got going. No. He was a good man. A good man at encouraging other people. And who in here can't encourage other people? Who in here can't say a nice word about somebody else and encourage them? That's the power of Christian living. Work on growing in love, joy, and peace. Work on the fruit of the Spirit and see your life change and see other people's lives change around you as well. And we see one more example in the story of this church living out their Christian faith. Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. So there was this famine that came, and one of the Christians was a prophet and was able to predict that this famine would come. Prophets in the Bible were people that were given a direct, specific message from God, and this prophet named Agabus said a famine was coming, and just like he said, a famine came. And that gave the Christians in Antioch an opportunity to show their faith. Apparently, Antioch wasn't so much hit with this famine, but other parts of the Roman Empire, other parts where Christians lived, were. So do you know what those Christians did? They gathered an offering. And as each was able, they collected money, they gave money to this offering, and then they gave it to Barnabas and Saul, and Barnabas and Saul distributed it to other Christians who were in need. And you know what I love about that? These were people who were Christians for at most one year. These were Christians who were at most Christians for at tops one year. Do you know what that means? That means that Christians who others would have called immature in their faith were living out their faith right away. Often, sometimes, we talk about this idea that if you have a new person that comes to church or somebody that's newer to the faith, there are certain subjects you can't talk about, can't talk about money, can't talk about giving to the church. You don't want to talk about those types of things. But as the Church of Antioch, we see, we see right off the bat, new Christians out of love for Jesus in their heart, caring for other people, caring for other Christians, and giving out of love for Jesus in their heart. That reminds me of a Bible information class I was in a few years back at a different church. Uh, there was a woman named Mel, and the subject came up in that class. We were talking about how we share our faith with other people. And right away, she kind of gave the impression, sharing your faith with other people, no, that, 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 that's not for me. I, I mean, other people are better at talking, that kind of thing. Uh, Mel wasn't going to be somebody that shared her faith. But you know what was funny? A couple weeks later, Mel brought her mom to church, and then Mel brought her mom to that class, and later we said, hey Mel, it kind of looks like you shared your faith with somebody. And she said, oh no, that's just my mom, that doesn't count. And then a couple weeks go by, and she's telling us about a conversation she had at work about how somebody said something wrong about what Christians believe, and she said, actually, I'm taking this class, and in this class I learned this. And we said, hey, Mel, kind of sounds like you shared your faith. And she said, oh, no, that's just my friend at work. That doesn't count. And what I love to see is new Christians getting involved right away and seeing how the, as they learn the message of Jesus and what Jesus has done for them, right away they get involved, and right away they share their faith. And that leads to point number three. Christ for us leads to Christ in us. We have a God who is for us. We have a God who is for us and not against us. Jesus proved that. He died on the cross for us. He came to this world just to give up his life to take away all of our sins. God is for us. 
And as we grow in that message, as we grow in that message that God is for us, that Christ is for us, that will lead to Christ in us. The Bible says that Christ is inside of us. Think about that for a moment. That Christ is inside of you. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means, that Christ is inside of you? It means when you lend a hand and help your neighbor, your hand is the hand of Christ helping that person. When your hands open up a children's Bible or a devotion book and you read that children's Bible with your child, those are the hands of Christ keeping that book open. When your hands open up your wallet and you give to this church to support the mission of this church of sharing the gospel with those in our community, those hands that went into your wallet are the hands of Jesus giving to this mission. As we live out our faith as a church, we have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ because we have a God who is for us and we have a God who is in us. So let's live our faith. Let's not be afraid to show our faith. Let's be the light of the world. Let's be the salt of the earth. Let's love one another as Jesus commanded us because we have a God who is for us. We do this all in his name. Amen. Please stand.